very good morning to all of you in Bangladesh and those who are joining us from outside Bangladesh. Wonderful to see you, Celia. I welcome you on behalf of Bangladesh Institute of Visa Security Studies to our webinar on pandemic through a gender lens. We are living in the COVID-19 era for last six months in Bangladesh. It has severe impacts on all walks of life in different dimensions. But at this, we have been analyzing aspects of the impacts of COVID-19 in all lives in our society. Special aspects of COVID-19 that is sometimes overlooked or not addressed adequately is how it impacts gender. And in Bangladesh, we have analyzed that it has severe negative impacts on different aspects of life in terms of gender. It has generated new dimensions of challenges that we have not seen before. In addition to all the challenges that COVID-19 poses in our life, the gender aspects takes a special place for the, the reason that it poses new, particularly in the form of managing their home, managing their online work from home, managing children and the education, and newer dimensions of gender violence at home. All these issues need to be addressed specially and specifically. Unfortunately, we have not seen sufficient discourse on this issue as we live through COVID in Bangladesh. But in BIPS, we have analyzed different aspects of COVID. And I'm happy to let you know that we have done a series of analysis and commentaries which has one of the special analysis has been COVID-19 pandemic through the gender lens and we have already published a commentary on that. It was authored by one of our research team colleagues, Onamika Borua, who will also make the presentation today to start the discussion subsequently. So with that very brief introduction, I welcome you all again to a webinar this morning. And I hope that we'll have a free and a candid discussion on which we shall also be making a special report based on the comments and the discussion that we have today. Before you go to the presentation proper, I would like to welcome Celia to give her comments. Celia, where are you at the moment, by the way? Which part of the world are you in? Good now? morning. I'm in Helsinki, Finland. Hello. <laughs> All right. And the yeah. uh, platform is now open to you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Major General uh, Munir Zaman. And uh, good morning. Salam alaikum to everybody in Bangladesh. Um, I hope you can hear me all right um, and see me. Uh, I am, as I said, in Helsinki, but I did live in Bangladesh for three years. Um, so during that time, I came, came to know BIPs very well, and, and we have been working with them for a long time. So thank you, BIPs, for hosting this webinar. Um, as I said, my name is Celia. I'm with the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, IFAS in other words, and we work on democracy and elections issues around the world. Um, and we actually have been doing quite a lot of work as it pertains to uh, research in COVID and elections and democracy and how, how those things intersect. But, but also today we're looking at specifically the gender aspects of, of COVID and how that impacts women and, and especially in public life. Now, I mean, we, we all know that women spend more time at home than men do. And as a result, caretaker duties mostly fall on women. So there's that additional burden that a pandemic 
places on women that that we have seen and probably many of you have seen and i'm i'm really sorry for those who have been infected by covid because i know that in bangladesh the infection rates are quite high um and uh but of course then there are other less direct impacts of covid like the economic impact people losing their jobs you know in jute mills and the ready-made garment sector and things those uh, these types of disruptions and workers will will touch on that too Um, um, something that has been noted across the world that gender-based violence has increased because people are essentially forced to spend more, more time at home and then the aggression uh, comes out in the home sphere. Um, but, but nevertheless, I know that there are many not so great impacts of COVID from a gender perspective, but there's one positive thing I'd like to highlight and perhaps you have seen this. But in many countries with female leaders, um, COVID responses have been determined to be more effective. And, and um, so uh, very often the example of New Zealand is pointed out, but also my home country of Finland. Uh, we have a female prime minister who's um, about a decade younger than I am. Um, and she has been handling the crisis along with her very female heavy cabinet very, very well, actually. So infection rates have remained low here. And, um, and the economic impacts are severe, but not quite as bad as in many other countries. So we are not out of the woods yet. There's no need to congratulate anybody, but there is some initial evidence that female-led countries are in a slightly better position than, than other countries. So let's hope that in Bangladesh that also uh, remains the case. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that we can discuss some of these things, both the positive and the negative in the coming hour. Um, but thank you very much to Bips for hosting again. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Celia, for that introduction. And I must say that Bips has been a partner with IFES in Bangladesh for quite some time. We found our cooperation with IFS very effective and very meaningful. Currently, we are engaged in a number of issues on a project with IFS, and we hope to continue our contribution and our cooperation with IFS in the coming days. I shall now turn to my colleague, Onamika Borwa, who will make the initial presentation, which will generate the discussion. presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Munujam, sir. Now I'll start the presentation of you. I hope I'm audible enough for everyone. So, as we all know, today I'm Onamika Borua, currently working as a research assistant at Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies. And to handle of crisis whenever it happens, always hits the vulnerable population and mostly the women. And today, through this presentation, we'd like to discover the aspects that COVID-19 has created in different dimensions and how it has 
affected the subbands from indigenous communities and other marginalized communities of society. And lastly, we'd like to recommend some of these gender sensitive approaches that we can actually take over for the post pandemic Bangladesh. Firstly, let's talk about pandemic and gender. As I already mentioned, any kind of crisis, whether it's an environmental disaster, whether it's a pandemic like a global COVID-19 and Make shock and global health security also very much. This pandemic has really affected us all, and whenever a Concerns like this that involve the masses, whether it's globally, regionally, or locally, it will always be felt differently based on the economy, privilege, and most important of that environmental not exception to Bangladesh as a country with huge and progress in this gender dimension and helplessness. The disruption of global supply chain, the loss of FDI, the loss of different trade disruptions, other sectors which are affected have created a huge issue in our country and created a massive economic shock as well. And all of this pandemic after effects of the pandemic has, has a gender dimension to it. But it is also clear that a pandemic's such as this would increase the existing social inequalities and also increasing it between the genders, mainly the male and the female, affecting them differently. And also the other gender identities like the transgender community and the marginalized groups in the society and also creating the pre reinforcing the pre-existing discrimination within the social indigenous and marginalized people of the society. Moving on. Now getting straight to the point, the impact of COVID-19 on gender dimension. Before starting the um, highlighting the impacts, I would like to quote psychology University of Dhaka, who mentioned that diseases are not gendered. They scare men and women equally, but it is the system that is putting further stress on the women. And we and uh, seeing the, the overall global crisis and the global arena and also in Bangladesh, the statement is very much clear to us. So moving on to mention, I would like to uh, break down in different points such as the gender. Uh, first, we will discuss about the gender based violence. Secondly, the impact on the psychological and mental health of women and children, socioeconomic impact on women with occupation, Crisis of female migrant workers. And lastly, the impact communities and also the other gender identities and the marginalized community. Firstly, the gender based violence. Gender based violence is not really a new term to us, and it has been prevalent in the surface of the society for a very long time. According to WHO, out of every three women in the world now face physical or sexual violence. And, the, and in this period of COVID-19, the rate of domestic violence or the gender-based violence have risen in an immense way. If I just quote of two of the reports, the France reports of in, uh, increased of uh, gender-based violence to 30 to 36 percent, and in U.S. it has increased in, by 25 percent, and in Brazil 40 to 45 percent. By gender-based violence, today here we would like to highlight the rise of gender-based violence in Bangladesh and. Uh, the intimate partner or domestic abuse that our women or our children are facing due to the confinement or the pandemic crisis issues, sexual harassment, mental health breakdown, unmet needs of SRHR services 
for the sexual reproductive health rights services and also the work life imbalance all of these factors are actually contributing to the overall scenario of gender based violence and the strategies that different nations have been taken to tackle the covid-19 pandemic health security issue the lockdown and the associated strategies and policies with this have actually added more fuel to this gender based violence scenario in bangladesh violence against women had been an endemic issue for a very long time and recent confinement measures that have been taken our nation as well have made the situation more or worse women are experiencing these and others according to a recent report of manusha jana foundation a reputed organization working on the women issues have stated that 4249 women and 456 children were subjected to domestic violence in 27 districts in of bangladesh amid the lockdown implemented by the government to combat the coronavirus pandemic and i would like to add that 1672 women and 424 children have faced this kind of violence for the first time in this pandemic very sad due to the unemployment and massive economic fallout the earning members which in most cases are men in bangladesh are lashing out their frustrations over the women and children and they are mainly becoming the main victims of this kind of domestic violence from their families sadly lack of access towards the information on gender based violence hotlines and safe shelters for women due to fighting this pandemic crisis are leaving women and the unfortunate children with many fewer options to escape this kind of violence moving on from gender based violence i would like to highlight the impacts on psychological and mental health of women and also of the adolescents young girls or the children as we all know a substantial number of women and young girls are facing mental health issues in bangladesh for a very long time and the youths are one of the most affected population in this regard and in this covid-19 pandemic the issues are actually raising day by day uh in our society discussing mental health and sorting up for help is already a taboo established in the society there is not much done to, the, to remedy the situation and in this covid-19 situation the pandemic issues like as i mentioned the massive economic fallout the job insecurity of the women or the girls who are the only earnings uh, i mean earning members of the families the single headed families or and the socio economic strain the work from home scenarios that is actually burdening the women workload is not harming the women only physically it also harming the women mentally as well and negatively affecting their psychological health increasing number of women as we already mentioned the gender based violence uh, issues increasing number of women children and adolescents or young girls are actually facing and experiencing different kinds of domestic cases which is actually adding fuel to this mental health breakdown issues and the work life imbalance is also another issue in this sector the most of the people in this covid-19 apart from gender grounds are at risk of mental breakdown but due to this kind of financial issues things are actually making the women more vulnerable to this issue only recognizing this factor that the yeah, women or the children are actually having uh, psychological issues or the mental health breakdown is happening is not really enough we need to take some immediate action for the post pandemic time so that the issues can be resolved as well i have already talked about gender based violence issue the rise in gender based violence globally and in national level as well i have talked about how it is affecting the psychological health and the mental health breakdown of the women children or the youths now let's talk about the socio economic impact on women with occupation socio economic impact of covid-19 exposes the long stand home and in the economic sector as well according to un women 60% of the women are involved in the informal sector around the world where 40% 40% work in the textile industry hospitality and caregiving sectors and 
in Bangladesh workforce, there are among the 60 million in Bangladesh workforce, 18.9 million are women. The women participation have been increased 16.67% through the organization and of but unfortunately this pandemic at COVID-19 outbreak is already having a significant impact on this increased rate and making a downfall already as it is impacting the small businesses in Bangladesh. It is impacting the trade disruption, the um, different industries, shops, restaurants, and also the different informal sectors like beauty salon, etc., where the women are the major workers. Many female workers in Bangladesh actually do not have the job security during this pandemic because max as i already mentioned maximum of them are actually engaged in the informal sectors or the day-to-day -day basis works 63 percent of women reported being with additional household chores in the country in recent times. If I talk about different industries or just the delivery stuff at the early times felt uns this situation is impacting one by one issues. Then one of the most affected sector or industry I should say in this pandemic is our arms industry places workers in a very precarious position also like uh, the child care elderly care providing sick care and now it is more prominent because of the COVID-19 issue as many of the members can or might have got affected and these responsibilities have increased due to the crisis time and on average, 80% of those working in garment factories are women and have lost their jobs, which actually made the scenario more crucial because now they are jobless, they don't have the job security, and many of them do not have that kind of relief or any kind of allowances as well. And they have to take care of their family now and also the econ and also think about the economic expense, which is actually making the whole scenario very and the women of this sector very much vulnerable. Already, uh, the economic state has a particularly devastating effect on women garment workers and their communities because the lowest paid and few, of, uh, and few of these women aren't enough to have accumulated a financial safety, but the low pay and low power positions now make negotiating contracts difficult for the women workers. And with COVID-19, it is the temporary workers who are the first to lose their jobs with no contractual agreements to cover any kind of paid leave or severance. And they have shown now the social benefits are limited. The primary uh, care, social care and family care issues are, are raising. The women are facing mental health very much upset. They are in fear of um, infection. They are in fear of the socioeconomic and financial crisis. They are in fear of the family protection. So all of these things are actually at, um, at leading to a long-term effect to their economic and social life and a fear that many of these women or the young girls who are actually financially independent may not actually be able to return in the post female migrant girls, as according to refugee agreements, the RMRIU research unit, 60% of women, uh, migrant households depend on remittance for daily expenses. And while male makes up most migrant workers, female migrants are 
constituted 12% of the total migrant workers who left for abroad for to work as the domestic help in different uh, foreign countries and so the area of the beauty of manpower employment and training bmet so this kind of situation actually shows us that uh, migrant female did same as their male counterparts and this kind of restricted measures and constant surveillance of the employers are actually affecting the whole situation very negatively making the women migrants more vulnerable to the abuse in the workplaces and their reports of these migrant workers are facing more abuse during this kind of lockdown as well and we also know that uh, many migrant workers like almost 4 lakh migrant workers in early times have returned in bangladesh and they now particularly holds for them then i have talked about different kinds of industry and the uh, different uh, communities which are a, part, uh, a big part of our society as well due to this lockdown people who work as daily ne need basis from different ethnic communities like the garo the chakma etc and also the indigenous communities like bede munda this kind of community works but in this lockdown as due to precaution we have to take different kinds of log, um, measures their work are highly affected and many of them are not still able to get back to their works because um, though some of them have but not the full majority and also the stay at home orders um, previously and the suspension of economic activities have impacted the women who are disproportionately engaged in different informal job sectors like domestic work sex work street cleaning a micro business and to be very honest all of this women of this vulnerable group or the marginalized communities have to relay a big time on the charities and the relief that is given by different government institutions different social welfare organizations ngos ngos and it is really unfortunate that they are actually surviving every each day one day by one now if i talk about the basic health facilities and the access to the basic human necessities this marginalized people or the uh, different people from the social class or the vulnerable population or the poor people are not actually getting the proper basic health facilities they should have and if i mention the differently abled people it has become more crucial and one of the main thing that i would like to uh, mention here is the transgender community the transgender community now though they have had the voting rights and everything they are actually and um, now get their gender identity but still they are really stigmatized and the social position of them are not really well current problems as you can see in the slide uh, from a uh, source from tbs news is that they have no income source firstly and they have to totally depend on the relief for these charities of different organizations as they don't have any income source they are in pressure of the land owners because they are not able to pay their day to day livelihood expenses and even there are stigmas that they can actually carry the corona virus with them wherever they go so this kind of things actually making them doubly marginalized and also making the social barriers more difficult situation for them to access any kind of um, what can i say basic health facilities or basic uh, human necessities and not only this the mi migrated people communities of migrated people the fishermen the cleaners the sweepers who are actually the marginalized community of society all of them are actually having this kind of issues in their own community and are totally depending on the charities and relief aids only now i tried to depict the whole situation of this covid 19 impact on the gender dimension now 
let's talk about what we can do there are problems there will be problems but we should actually look forward we should talk about that what we can do or what we can come up with as recommendations towards our stakeholders that they can take initiatives to in the post pandemic times to solve these issues firstly women's organization community based organization must effectively respond to this kind of things and also in this crisis and it is clear that we need a blend of strategies of policies effective interventions to combat this kind of gender issues the government legal development agencies ngos ingos social welfare organization all of them should work with each other because only working with each other we can come up with some effective gender sensitive uh, approaches special ssnb program needs to be taken for the vulnerable population of different social class uh the transgender community whether it's especially for the uh, female head households the women the vulnerable children the marginalized community all of them should be covered in this wider and coordinated provision of essential healthcare services including access to srhr service mental health support needs to be ensured for the vulnerable women and children we should also give a special attention to our pregnant mothers and newborn babies and ensure a safe pregnancy and childbirth as well as because they are our future and also uh, this pregnant women and newborn babies do not get affected we should give a special attention to this and as i already mentioned that there are different communities and marginalized people who are actually surviving on the charities and reliefs by given by different institutions so the transparency and relief giving services by priority based targeting the female headed house the uh, single mothers the most vulnerable and marginalized communities must be ensured and also to prevent gbv the gender based violence any kind of domestic abuse or sexual harassment hotline services needs to be ensured and the service provider should be trained in such a way that they become more approachable and provide rights based survival centric guidance and instruction so that actually it helps this violence survivor and some ever also the transgender communities who are actually becoming practically jobless and homeless and who might need a place to stay emergency the information of the emergency response and the hotline services in the domestic abuse or if anyone faces this kind of gbv issues and also the relief whereabouts hygiene issues etc in a coordinated manner lastly i uh, i would like to conclude this section saying that it is very important for us as a society to abolish any harmful gender norms practice or superstitions regarding this pandemic because we have already seen an example in the transgender community that people are thinking that they are actually carrying the coronavirus but this is not the thing the, all of them are not may, may not be affected and carry this kind of thing so abolishing any harmful gender norms practice and superstition regarding pandemic by understanding the dynamics of the vulnerability to infection exposure and treatment that can influence men and women and different genders differently should be ensured quote mr by mr antonio the secretary general of the united nations we are in this together and we will get through this together and we need a coordinated partnership among the different stakeholders and also a coordinated nature of the men and women and the different gender to Uh, post pandemic bangladesh to everyone thank you for giving attention to my presentation and thank you for giving your valuable time to me and i would like to conclude here thank you very much onamika thank you very much that was it is not it is not men now it is women because women are the frontliners mostly New York Times in another article they have published that 78% of the health workers 
uh, our care and caregivers are women. And even in Wuhan, Wuhan where the pandemic was started before, and uh, it was over outbreak over there, they claim the uh, women are 90, uh, they were 90% uh, of the women, they are the workers there. So we can see it is everywhere the women, women are vulnerable for these, all these uh, significant reasons. In our context, if we come to the point of uh, Bangladesh, we can see starting from the household workers, starting from the root level to the uh, middle lower level to the upper level. If we start from the root level, we can see all the women, they are uh, trying their level best to feed their family on their own. There are single mothers, there are widowers, there are so many victims are there. They have to earn their living on their own. And if you go to the middle or they are coming from rural to urban and they're like uh, searching for jobs starting from the brick field to the identity sectors, most of them 60%, 40 to 60% study says, 40 to 60% are them, they are mostly women. And if we talk about the corporate ladies, uh, nowadays we are all empowered. We always say, yes, we are empowering ourselves. Each and every single day we are fi fighting for the establishment. We are targeting the sustainable development goal for bringing up the equality. Both men and women are equal here. But end of the day, if you ask a corporate lady, uh, what do you think? What's your opinion? They will say, end of the day, we are women. So these are the consequences of our society, just uh, to share with you. And now I would like to share uh, some points on SSNPs. As Anamika has already described about SSNPs, uh, our government, I must mention, our government has already allocated uh, more than 74,000 crore taka last year in the fiscal year, if you talk about 2019 to 20. They were allocated, uh, they were planning to allocate them on 70, more than 74,000 crore. But I guess after the post pandemic situation, it will be quite different scenario. But because pandemic like COVID 19 has never been struck before globally, and from our context, for, from our Bangladeshi context, we can say it, was, it is unimaginable, in, unimaginable, and the scenario is going to be the worst. So, so many factors has might to be included in this sector is this segment so i think uh, the organization the private organizations the other ngos they can come along with so many new plans and interventions uh, like uh, like i say we can uh, talk about the new risk factors we should go up on those factors we can discuss the new risk factors we can uh, go for the microcredit mapping again the old mapping, old uh, planning, old intervention, and old budget might not be uh, profitable or might not be helping the uh, vulnerable society in Bangladesh. So I, I would like to highlight upon those part, and I would like to um, share something. The UING in the government NGOs and the INGOs, every, everyone should work up on basis. We can go for the BGD uh, who are uh, who are already been included in the digit card holder segment. There might be we can uh, start some new planning with disabled children, disabled girl children, girl child, girl children. Those needs to be included in the disabled uh, who have already whose family has already been struck by the COVID-19. We don't even know. We know we don't even know the. Uh, significance and the consequences of those families. So I think this should things should be uh, big to the point. One more point: an entrepreneur like us and the uh, society and the ladies, the women who are working uh, for the change maker for change making of the society, working as a social development worker, even working as a leadership development and other other uh, ladies also who might need some help financially and and who might need some help uh, for the mitigation uh, of the overall constructions of the society after post pandemic situation so financial res rescue packages i think should be included for these ladies these women uh, also i guess so and uh, credit unemployment benefits can be implied to 
some extent, I guess the government and the non-government organization should come up and visit it together. So we will be benefited, of course, because we have to, uh, we cannot stop our employees to work up and such uh, significance. We have to pay them, you see. So many employees are working under our uh, uh, sites, working under our projects. And so they are all like, they are working day to day basis. They are, they are just struggling so badly during this pandemic situation. If the government and the NGOs and other uh, organization come up with financial rescue mitigation planning and overall implementation, I think this sector will be saved. Okay. And lastly, as Anamika has already described about transgender, during my previous training sessions, I get an opportunity. So, uh, uh, come up and working with some are socially alleviated, socially alienated. And the thing, uh, if we think about our context from Bangladeshi context, so many um, transgender people, they are not all from the uh, underprivileged society, even from the uh, middle lower class background, middle class background, I have, I have seen them transforming this um, and coming to this community, including themselves, they are uh, hoping for the level best, other NGOs and organizations helping them out with financial benefits and everything. But as the poverty, uh, as the pandemic started, so many, many of them personally who, who I have been contacted with, and then they started calling me, their sister, can you help me? Do you have your, and you have so many uh, connections and networks with so many people around, so we are helpless. Can you please uh, collect some uh, donations to some organization or personal. I tried to help them out initially and I did so. But uh, to be very frank, I, in generally, I, I talked with so many organization owners and um, network and connections I have. People were barely, barely uh, was interested to help them on. And that struck me very badly. That was struck in my mind. How this, this society, are these people going to survive? So something must be included uh, after uh, the pandemic interventions for them also. And I hope so. Uh, we all can uh, help them together because we are always uh, talking about the uh, goals, the sustainable development goals uh, that no one should, the Agenda 2030 said no, no one should live behind. So why should these people uh, should be left behind, right? So hoping for the best. That's all from my part. And I, so I make some, I, I am able to shed some light upon this topic, and which will be benefited our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Anamika. Thank you, sir. Thank you for Thank your you so comments much. and very detailed observations. Um, my apologies to everybody. My internet connection has become unstable. So can I request Shafka to take it over from here and conclude till the end? Thank you. You need to unmute Shafka. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Ms. Kadri for her very detailed comments as well. Uh, that was very helpful. We are particularly grateful to you for sharing your sort of personal experience as well of how you have dealt with the pandemic. Um, in the interest of time, we will uh, take a couple more questions. Uh, I would request the other participants to keep their question brief so that we can take more questions and have a uh, greater discussion. And then we will come back to Anamika. Any questions? Right, I think Onamika, maybe we can uh, start with you first and then we will take a question later. I think people are still formulating their questions. Thank you. Onamika, please go ahead. Yes, sir. No, I see so, Tasneem wants to get the floor. Jeff, you can see Tasneem. 
I didn't see it initially. But yeah, look, we can we can uh, get a question from Mr. Tasneem Tayyab, please. Yes, hi, my name is Tasneem. I'm a columnist for the Daily Star newspaper, and I work full time with Fairrunner Foundation. It's one of the non-profit impact organizations that work towards the achievement of the SDGs. Uh, one of the one of the queries that one of one of the aspects about this uh, gender uh, issue with related uh, related to covid-19 that i have been thinking about for the last couple of uh, months was we know that most of the women work in the informal sector and they have been affected in many ways as we have seen in ms barwa's presentation what kind of uh, policy support and intervention should we consider uh, at this point in time to rehabilitate the women who have been affected by the pandemic thank you uh yes uh, i think we will come back to anamika now we have two more questions we'll go for them later anamika floor is yours thank you Uh, thank you, Ms. Kadri, and also Ms. Taib, for your remarkable observations and also for the questions. First of all, if I would like to, uh, I would like to talk about the observation of Ms. Pusna Kadri. Observations like uh, the. SSNP issues and the transgender issues. And yes, of course, the transgender people should actually get the appropriate amount of relief. And also, we should actually take a special attention to them so that they can. Establish themselves and the girls' children, and I think a government is already taking different kind of uh, with nineteen and also fifty million USD has given to the RMG sectors uh, so that they can actually uh, give the allowances and help the women uh, workers and other workers as well. So yeah. This observations were really good. Now going to Ms. Tasneem Taib, um, the question that the what kind of policy intervention as yeah, we have already talked about the informal job sectors and how it is affecting them. And also uh, the informal job sectors right now, I think the most effective uh, strategy or policy should be uh, taken by the government stakeholders is that they should uh, come up with a SSNP program specially targeting this women. I think if there is a proper um, safety net for them, then who are already affected by their job sectors and also are not able to survive in this pandemic or are actually struggling to support their families, they can actually uh, come under this uh, safety nets. And also, I would like to mention that COVID in COVID-19 pandemic, there is a rise of the new poor class which we should actually keep in mind. So the vulnerable population nine is actually ri rising day by day. So a proper SSNP program uh, just targeted for the female households or this informal job sectors, women or these vulnerable people can be a big help or a big policy factor for the overall country, which can actually help us a lot. And uh, another thing, I think can be that uh, if we talk about this is something a long term effect. If it's so a proper assessment that who actually are in need of um, any kind of allowance or any kind of help, 
can act, uh, will actually contribute to the policy factors later for and it will be easier for different kind of NGOs or INGOs or organizations and especially the government to take any kind of policy formations if they can actually know the proper figure that who actually in uh, who are actually in need of uh, any kind of uh, SSNP programs or any kind of package uh, that they need to give. Uh, I think that will all for me move, uh, giving to Shapkat sir. Thank you Anamika. Um, we will take four questions uh, in this order and then we will come back to you. Ms. Nura Faizun Nahar followed by Mr. Sharzil followed by Mr. Abid Rahman from IFS and then final question will be from Firoz Shravi from BIPS. So uh, I'll start with Ms. Nura Faizun Nahar. Thank you. topic. Um, I would like to uh, take on two points. Uh, I would like to mention on two points here. First of all, we, yes, we have at this point of time, uh, we have talked about as uh, Anamika has already talked about uh, the pregnant women and also the healthcare services for them, especially the people who, as we know, uh, because of their healthcare facilities that we have currently in Bangladesh, there are a lot of uh, hospitals who have really a lot of covid free patients and what happens is like for people like like uh, pregnant women uh, they are having they are facing a lot of issues regarding this especially going to the hospitals or even meeting their um, doctors and having any kind of uh, you know uh, sorting out any kind of issues and in in on top of that because of this pandemic virus and because of this coronavirus, they are also because of their health health issues and also their about, about their babies being uh, delivered. Where where would that be and everything that is related to it? So in this kind of situations, when we have seen from uh, after the lockdown that every kind of measures that has been taken it's it are mostly uh, reactive rather than proactive measures i would say because after something has happened maybe uh, some measures have been taken but you know the measures that to prevent those uh, issues uh, that those measures are not seen much so in those cases, in those cases when uh, we have issues like this, what are the steps that has been taken uh, to, uh, you know, to solve this issue? And then in another case that we were talking about, since we are having a lot of job cuts and also there are issues like in, especially in garment sectors that there has been job cuts and then uh, less uh, reduce of the amount of money uh, that is the salary. So in that case, what we are expecting is uh, that an automation might take place. So in that case, what would happen as we have already talked about that the most of the women are in the are working in the RMG sector. So if the automation takes place, what happens is what we have also seen in the past that whenever automation take place, taken place, the, the, it's, it's the women who has been affected mostly. So in those cases, we would need different kind of, uh, you know, trainings for these women not to get jobless. So do we have this kind of, uh, uh, are we even thinking about this kind of uh, measures being taken or like we have already taken this kind of measures already or we are expecting what kind of measures we can take to, you know, 
to have uh, to prevent another havoc to work on. So I think that's all from me. Thank you. I thank you for your question and comments. Very, uh, thank you so much. We will now come to Mr. Sharzil for the next question, and then right after him, we will go to Mr. Abid Rahman. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, BABSS, for inviting me here. And apart from Anamika's presentation, as she said, hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I think Yes, we can, can hear you. We can okay, hear okay, you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, as per Anamika's presentation, as she said, female might not be able to be financially independent after the pandemic. But nowadays we are seeing everywhere, almost in every social media or uh, overall, like uh, entrepreneurship has become uh, becoming more females than male, right? So what do you think about these female entrepreneurs and they are doing themselves lots of things and at the same time they are delivering their products by themselves. So uh, is there any policies or is there any health policies is taken by the government or some other peoples or some other organizations are thinking about that if they get uh, if they get COVID-19 positive or if, if anything happens to them, what will happen? And uh, how do you think about it? Like, why are they becoming more entrepreneurs nowadays? And uh, why females' entrepreneurship are becoming more? I think that's all. Uh, thank, thank you, you Shafterbhai, for Abhidurma. giving me the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, I will keep my video off because uh, it, it, my internet is not stable as I speak. Um, so at IFAS, we are working on, on the final steps of doing a online research on uh, violence against politically active and clinic, uh, civil, uh, civilly engaged women in Bangladesh. So my question is, how, how do you tackle with uh, uh, similar situations for younger people who are more vulnerable uh, when, when it comes to online targeting and online violence? Uh, is, there, is there a good measure that people can follow or there, are there steps that uh, people can come up with so that they are targeted less and uh, are, are less vulnerable in terms of being uh, harassed online. And the second question I ask uh, is to both the speakers, uh, especially to Anamika, because I, I, I could hear a lot of uh, data being shared. Uh, so would you, would you, it would be kind if you could let's know the sources of the data that you were mentioning during your presentation and also the uh, online violence online bullying is definitely a very serious issue and i think uh, there's a need to do more work on this across the board we will now come to firoza ashravi assalamu alaikum sir i'm firoza ashravi a research intern in Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies. My, my question to Ms. Onamika would be that when she mentioned about Bangladeshi women being migrated to Saudi Arabia for work, um, is there any information about how they are in this current pandemic situation? Have they returned or not? Or if there is any mechanism uh, through which they're being followed up or checked upon? Or if they have not returned, sure. is there any... Uh, uh, do they have access to health uh, insurance or which uh, we can uh, we can check actually uh, the fact that if they are uh, how vulnerable they are or if they are all right or not because they are a big part of our workforce. Right, uh, we uh, will now go back to Anamika, and then if we have time, we might take one more question. Anamika, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for and thank you everyone for the remarkable questions. I will try to be a bit brief because of the time constraint. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, the questions of, of Ms. Nuri Faizunahar. Uh, what are what can be the measures for the pregnant women due to the uh, health facility scarcity? And another question was if automation happens, what can uh, be done or what can measures be taken for the 
uh, garment sector or R&D sector workers. Uh, first of all, if I talk about the uh, safe pregnancy and childbirth, uh, we have uh, we know that whenever, as you already mentioned, whenever an incident happens, then this kind of things actually comes to surface. That yeah, uh, these issues are happening and these problems are being faced. And in this COVID nineteen, we have seen that uh, the to, um, the overall health sector was in stress due to handling the immense pressure of the COVID-19 patients. And because of this, maybe, uh, we have observed that many other uh, patients, uh, maybe that can be cancer patients or others, have not been able to get the proper access to the healthcare facilities like the others. But, uh, and yeah, it is a big challenge for the pregnant women as well. So I think uh, to, tackle this kind of issues. So I'm actually mentioned about the uh, uh, to ensure safe pregnancy uh, measures. I actually mentioned due to this issue that yeah, we need to ensure safe pregnancy first because uh, rather than other women, these women are more vulnerable because they cannot actually take care of themselves. They need help in those times, those crucial times, and their babies need that kind of care. So maybe the health sector or the health, uh, the stakeholders of the health ministry can take a proper policy or proper measure and assess that how many uh, pregnant women or uh, how many hospital uh, and, and assure uh, may take a policy or can assign some of the designated uh, clinics or some of the designated uh, hospitals or healthcare um, organizations that can actually help particularly the, to ensure the safe pregnancy and also the NGOs and other organizations who are working with the women and working with the child development or childbirth ensuring the safe pregnancy who have the agenda in their uh, organ as an uh, agenda in their organization they can also help these uh, women to ensure the preg and also help the government stakeholders also and, and to ensure this kind of safe pregnancy and childbirth. Moving on, uh, if automation happens, uh, automation, it's bound to happen at some point uh, in different sectors because of uh, we are going to digitalization, we are going to the uh, artificial intelligence. So there is uh, the fourth industrial revolution is coming uh, very soon and automation is a part of it as well. So for the post pandemic uh, post pandemic time i think uh, we should make more skill based uh, curriculum in trainings and others and there have been different kinds of trainings for the women to be skillful but we should actually make the women more technically advanced i think that will be a big uh, help to the uh, women for not for just for the uh, garments workers or the manufacturing industry, for every woman. If they are more technically advanced, they can actually opt for freelancing. They can actually offer different kinds of different skills. With building different skills, they can actually go for different organizations or different uh, work sectors and actually work uh, from home to abroad. As work from home is the new trend uh, in our job sector, so they can actually use that opportunity in a positive reinforcement and make themselves more skillful. Uh, at their own educational cap, um, qualifications and use that if automation, if God forbid automation happens and they lose their current jobs. I think um, making in the, in the uh, skillful at the individual level will be the solution to it. Uh, moving on to Mr. Sharzil's question. Thank you for the question about the female entrepreneurs. And yes, it is a good observation that now the female entrepreneurs are growing day by day. I think one of the main factor to this female entrepreneurship growth is that as uh, there is a massive economic fallout and there is massive joblessness in different sectors. So now uh, the male counterparts or the households earning members are actually los losing their jobs. Now they're actually uh, going for an alternative ways to uh, maintain or to serve, I should say to survive. This, uh, not just this pandemic, their overall households. So in this situation, uh, or not all of the uh, women, though majority of the women are engaged in some kind of works, but still there are a chunk of big portion of women who, are, who were not actually involved in any kind of economic activity rather than uh, their household uh, maintain, um, uh, managing. So now the female entrepreneurs are more encouraged 
to be that alternative way to actually support their family or to support their partners or the earning members so that uh, it can actually help to think. another thing is it's a very good uh, our government and other organizations social welfare organizations have actually encouraged women to be in different small entrepreneurships for a very long time and that actually has raised the uh, 16.67% women participation in the economic activity and our if not just the elderly women if we just look our young women or the youths right now many of the youth uh, young girls are actually uh, getting into becoming more skillful day by day whether it's in graphics whether it's in other in other technical advancement or in any kind of uh, skills that they can actually be good at so these things are actually encouraged for a very long time but this pandemic has showed us as that we already sure is that uh, to maintain or to support the family first and so uh, sorry for the interruption so mainly uh, for the family support and to uh, continue the economic flow uh, moving on to uh, I would like to uh, answer Ms. Feroz's question first, then I would like to go to the Mr. Abit's question. I hope that's okay. Uh, Ms. Feroz has mentioned that uh, migrant, yes, migrant workers are, as I already told, that migrant workers are returning in a huge chunk. And uh, still, unfortunately, we didn't actually get the exact proportion. The, uh, female uh, migrant workers are actually returned but they have mentioned like an, uh, as a percentage or like that the yeah, uh, huge majority are returning but as i already mentioned the female workers there are in a very bad state who are actually confined in that and couldn't return who have returned they are in their job in security but who have con who are confined there they are actually uh, not taken care that much of properly and I haven't heard still a very significant measure just for the migrant workers, uh, female migrant workers that is taken by any government stakeholders or any other issues. If uh, I would like to get back to you whether uh, if and I would like to say that uh, if there we need to take some measures for assessment again to know that uh, what condition they are right now and uh, the government it is the um, it is actually the government stakeholders duty to assure that but still i haven't heard anything about this sector thank you and moving on to mr abit's questions uh, yes the online bullying is a big threat not just for the women and online targeting for the uh, youths as well and this has uh, the infodemic or the fake news spread and the vulnerability and the the perpetrator minds or the different um, abusers actually taking this kind of uh, situation at their favor because now many of the youths are main a significant amount of people are actually uh, spending their time on the online online platform so the online platform is has become more uh, what can I say, more easier to target or to uh, target this kind of vulnerable minds and to actually get through their minds and play with their emotions and make them do some uh, and bring them in a negative effect. And infodemic, as I would like to say, the fake news, the spread of fake news regarding different kinds of uh, issues is another fact that is actually making easier that uh, to the online targeting. And as you mentioned that uh, the data I have collected from different sources like UN Women, this uh, RMRRU and different boundary statistics and the newspaper. I 
entrepreneur. answer would be uh, we live in the age of globalization and a opportunity and the major point uh, do the concluding remarks and then please sectors uh, in a very short period of time. I think uh, we covered almost everything and um, and I learned a lot. So thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to kind of um, think about, you know, as we consider sort of future issues that may still arise and, and kind of something to keep looking out for is perhaps uh, the online radicalization of people. So, so the ready, but I'm not sure if that has been looked at from a gender perspective yet, because I wonder if, if women, um, whether they're returning migrant workers or just otherwise, who are spending a lot of time at home and online, if they are also more vulnerable to radicalization as a result of COVID. radical to recruit is potentially and the cyclone obviously that you had but then also the flooding that continues to be quite extreme in Bangladesh and if if sort of a natural or man-made disaster um, could I, I mean if there's a second sort of disaster on top of the COVID disaster that would then change things quite a lot and and affect the most vulnerable again. So so I, I hope that doesn't happen, but it's something that I keep thinking about quite a bit. Um, so with that, um, I'm sorry, that's that's like a doom and gloom <laughs> sort of uh, conclusion. I don't mean to imply that at all. I think women are very resilient and, and um, you know, I think women also, and as we move through the COVID crisis, hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel at some point with this. Um, but thank you again to all the presenters and to now. Thank you, Cecilia. I uh, really appreciate your remarks. Uh, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, COVID-19 has thrown up a lot of different challenges for us. We are looking at it today for this particular webinar from a gender lens, but there are multifarious other problems as well that we are countering every day. The post-COVID world, whenever that comes, hopefully soon, will be very different from the world that we knew at the beginning of the year. The of that, that I'd like to share with you. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Celia in early March in Colombo, in Sri Lanka. And at that point, neither of us knew that five months down the road, things would be like this. So the situation uh, erupted so quickly in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, and so many other countries that it took us
understand how we deal with it. We are currently living it via web. Uh, work from home was an almost an unknown issue in Bangladesh. There was no concept of work from home barring a few international organizations. Today, many organizations she and international are implementing work from home. Uh, we had no concept, for example, of uh, social to learn and need more work. I want to particularly drop on CDS point about radicalization. We're absolutely right. Please stay connected with BIT.